man. Shortly after, he points his finger in Kamui's face and shouts that he should follow the same example. Kamui doesn't like it and calls the other a gothic witch, starting another fight between the two. Haltamesha interrupts the discussion and asks if Kamui and Nebulim stay, who will destroy the country, since fulfilling God's determinations is more important than her own life. Boldly and shaking his silky hair, Ulta Zora says to leave it to him but asks the queen to understand that he no longer intends to be merciful with humans. The original plan was to gather as many humans as possible in the capital and have Nibu's barrier erase them all without suffering or fear. After doing this in the capital, they would move on to the next city and do the same. But this would not be possible without some dose of violence. Convinced by the argument, Ultimatia decides not to question the methods of the lineage. From then on, it was without mercy. This response satisfies Zora, but he continues to recite the plan, saying that they should order the 40,000 inferior and median dragons in this country to attack the enemies. However, to calm his commander's anxiety, he says that despite everything, control will be maintained through a medial dragon. Then he declares that he and Tara will deal with the Princess of Cutlery and delegates Borgias to lead the dragon squadron as long as he doesn't kill everyone because they need to find out who attacked Tia. Having said that, Kamui asks if they are forgetting something. Then he supposes that perhaps Reaper is working with the Argentum Corps, but Zora replies that if that's the case, he will call Kamui, and the guy needs to appear at the speed of light. Meanwhile, Borgius reflects on how half of his lineage went down the drain, but the remaining members are all reliable and capable of protecting the progenitor, today and always. Until Zora turns to Terra and asks him to join the discussion, then the dragon completes that they must see themselves as members of the progenitor's body, and none of these members can be missing under any circumstances for her health. Having said that, he laments that the lineage has already suffered a huge humiliation by losing half the group and demands that none of those present die under any circumstances and above all, that everyone fulfills their mission. In a warehouse, Princess Starlia demonstrates a magical technique that forms a cage from silver pieces. This technique is supposedly effective against dragons, making it difficult for them to move around. Putting that aside, Ike takes the opportunity to ask the princess for her opinion on what Krish Weiss said about defeating three of the superior dragons at once and battling the monarch dragon in the capital. Upon hearing this, the princess mentions Ike's vision problem metaphorically stating that everything Krish said is clearly a mix of truths and lies. Therefore, one should not be distracted by non-essential information. Ike accepts the advice but reveals that there's something he can't ignore. What the redhead said about the superior dragons once being human and gaining their powers through the monarch's blood. According to Crimson, even Ulto Zora and Terra Tectra were once famous human warriors. Regarding this, the princess confirms it as true, stating she had suspected it as well. She uses the twins, Majorca and Fu as examples, saying that individuals born with high levels of magical power often have non-human characteristics, and the more powerful they are, the more pronounced these characteristics become. So the question remains about the fact that the highest order dragons are so similar to humans. They are not imitating humans, but rather humans who have become dragons. Contemplating this, Ike is apprehensive about the upcoming battle. But Starlia says it's easier to fight when dealing with a different species. After all, humans hunt other animals for food, so they shouldn't worry about this information about the superior dragons. The fact that they were once human only gives more reason for this conflict, so Ike should not hesitate. These are the enemies that must be eliminated for their survival. Meanwhile, Ragna wakes up from a nightmare and asks Crimson what time it is. The redhead replies that it's 3 a.m. on the ninth day. The two then catch up on each other's progress, both doing well in their respective roles, especially Crimson, who believes he helped the magician significantly with the teleportation circle issue. Leaving that aside, he mentions that Ragna is wondering why he advised against using silver in battle arts, a silver art. But before answering, he asks if Ragna could defeat Wolt Kemi if they fought right now. With some difficulty, Ragna admits that he couldn't. Crimson is relieved because his partner at least has that much sense. Wolt Kemi is formidable even among the superior dragons, so it's better for Ragna not to confront him at this moment. Moreover, this is the reason for not being able to use silver in battle arts. The adversaries already know Ragna is a human emitting silvering from his body, and a common superior dragon wouldn't stand a chance against him. If they discover Ragna's location, Ulta Zora won't hesitate to call Kamui, who will undoubtedly appear instantly. In the current situation, that would be a certain defeat. Therefore, Ragna's only option is to try to save as many people as he can. Meanwhile, Ike descends a ladder and enters a corridor. When he finds Fu acting strangely and asks who the woman is that ended up making the circle much better, Ike thinks it's good. However, Fu feels humiliated because, in their interaction, Crimson proved to be much more intelligent than him without any arrogance. The circle has improved so much that Fu no longer feels like it's his creation. 
Back in the cell, the twins return the poor, shattered Mr. Slime to Ragna. After going through all this humiliation, the little one becomes quite sad because he lost the pride of being a superior life form above humans and dragons and having gone through all that. Ragna didn't even know Slime had any sense of pride, but Crimson soon arrives in the cell and asks why the guy returned to this place. Ragna says he can only relax in this location. In any case, Crimson confirms whether the guy saved half of the silvery in his body and tells him to infuse all the remaining in a single weapon for him to use. In this case, he just needs to take a sword from the princess but must do it as deep as possible underground to avoid drawing attention from the lineage. Before Crimson leaves, Ragna asks to talk to Mr. Slime who is in bad shape. What the redhead does is slap him so hard that the little creature splats on the ground and then gets up all happy, as if it doesn't remember anything. The wizard confirms that only a good hit is needed for Slime to forget any bad memories. That said, he tells Slime to keep an eye on Ragna until the end of the imminent battle. Next, the wizard says that the battle will probably start around sunset, so it's good to prepare as quickly as possible. Before leaving, the princess appears. She asks Crimson about the people who were suddenly becoming discontented but have calmed down. But the wizard says he knows nothing. Anyway, there's also something the girl wants to discuss with Ragna alone. He follows her through a corridor and then she says that normally she would prefer to create a weapon just for him. Unfortunately, time is short, so we'll have to settle for one of the ones she presents to him. Ragna praises the quality of the swords and the girl boasts that even though they are mass-produced, she made them. In any case, there's something she needs to tell him before the battle starts. Meanwhile, the tutor secretly observes that the girl is meeting alone with the man she likes. Starlia tells Ragna that after the battle, she will join the Solarians. Even if the plan succeeds and they escape with all the soldiers and civilians, the future would be uncertain because it's difficult to feed more than a thousand people in an unknown country. So the only way to solve this is to become a member of the Solarian Church and become a dragon hunter so that in return, they protect her people. Ragna then asks if she knows what the Solarians are like, and the princess responds that they tried to recruit her once. She was not pleased with the offer and refused, but the situation is different now. The problem is that if she loses her life in this battle, the people will have no future even if they manage to escape the country. That said, she decides to ask Ragna that if she doesn't survive, he should join the Solarians in her place and lead her people and the soldiers. Of course, the boy isn't obligated to do this, but Starlia pleads with him to grant this request, and in return, she can do anything the guy asks. Ragna immediately refuses because he doesn't like this religion, so she'll have to become the dragon hunter on her own. The girl says she couldn't do it, and this leaves Ragna wondering why she's acting as if death is certain. Starlia says she has always lived based on her intuition rather than common sense, and that's what made her who she is today. Deep down, she recalls that since they began facing the blood of the wing, she has had this premonition that she is destined to die at the base, but she doesn't want to show this weakness. Therefore, she says that as a commander, it's natural to prepare for this kind of situation. Now changing her stance, the princess becomes more authoritative, abandoning the desire to make him like her. She points her swords at the guy and comments on him saying that she could use him. So the guy is her subordinate in this battle and must obey her. With this, Ragna thinks about how incredible the princess is. During battles, he rarely thinks about dying at the base and when he does, he imagines that it would be okay if it happened. The princess, on the other hand, is fully prepared for the worst, making him see her as much more capable than he is. And finally, as he always wanted people like her to survive in his place, in response, Ragna uses Silverine's battle arts, putting the rest of his power into the three swords and says that Ulto Zora, Terra Tectra, and the dragon army will perish before his blades. Almost crying, the princess suddenly flies away, leaving Ragna confused. The tutor asks what's happening, and the girl says that her swords are completely unworthy in the face of his effort. With all this, and after the compliments, the girl feels completely humiliated, but this increases her determination not to kick the bucket so soon to still get stronger and forge great swords. When the dragons start to appear, the citizens of the capital wonder why the creatures are coming out of the royal palace, and soon the attack begins. For some reason, the soldiers remain motionless and then start firing at the population. It turns out they are all under the control of Ulto Zora. Even the sword-wielding hunters end up being hit. From the people on the ground, red lines of energy begin to rise to the sphere of the Borgias dragon, which has already started to regenerate its body. Through a vision beyond reach, the progenitor observes the entire massacre with a sad face. She remembers Borgias' request to feed on these humans and that about 500,000 would be enough, but all of this would be so he can give his own life for the progenitor. Besides, Nebulon would take on the role of commanding the beasts, a good opportunity for him to gain experience. Anyway, the ancient dragon knows he won't live for much longer, 
so this is a chance to use the remainder of his life for the monarch. Moreover, after surviving the madness of the ancient monarch and the destruction of the lineage, Orgius lived only with the desire to see the lineage restored, and this wish was fulfilled by the progenitor. With this, Woltekemui appears totally insensitive, and says to let the old man do whatever he wants. He even supports this line of thinking. Back in the present, at the base, the sun is already setting and the Silver Brigade is gearing up for the arrival of the enemies. With a few words from Olto Zora, tentacles emerge from the ground and the princess realizes that the barriers she had placed in the earth have been broken. Despite it being a massive attack, she believes the base can withstand it. However, at that moment in the sky, Teratectra appears in its dragon form. It begins to descend, and Starlia is on the verge of despair, but she remembers a tip from Crimson to counter this attack. The impact causes minimal damage, while Ulta was certain it would explode the cliff. Through mental communication, Teratectra states that it was neutralized just before the collision. We see Ragna standing at the edge of the fissure formed by the collision, and it's revealed that it was the swords emitting the silverine that halted the attack. They still don't know that this is the Reaper they fear so much, so Ulta refrains from calling Kamui. Teratectra asks for the warrior's name, and internally, the warrior reflects on being terrible at talking to people but hating to speak with dragons. Thus, the response is silence. With that, Teratectra decides to communicate through violence. In the base, Ike, the guy with glasses, waits for the arrival of the enemies along with the rest of the Silver Brigade behind the bright protective barrier. Instead of dragons coming out of the hole in the wall, humans with zombie-like appearances enter. They explain that they were brought to serve as food for the dragons but managed to escape. The people request shelter and plead with the soldiers not to shoot as they continue to approach. It's at this moment that Ike recalls Crimson talking about Ulto Zora's chemical synthesis power enabling the hypnosis of victims. He tells the others not to lower their weapons, but now the zombies are too close for long-range combat, leaving only close-quarters combat. Nevertheless, the brigade manages to defend well against the zombified foes. Ike is no exception but hesitates when a child zombie appears to attack him. Luckily, Princess Steria shows no mercy and takes out all the advancing invaders. She takes the opportunity to say that they can only save the lives of the civilians they are defending and the soldiers beside each of them. Anyone beyond those mentioned must be eliminated without mercy, or she will have to do it herself. The speech works and the soldiers start attacking fiercely. Staria leaves Ike in charge of the base while she calls the twins, Chris and Tudor Nazarena, to join her in attacking the forest. In the distance, Ulto Zora is impressed with the princess's actions, but he comments that everything is going as planned. He intends to give a lesson on the battlefield, but the lessons will cost the princess her life. Meanwhile, we learn more about the superior dragons, also known as mature lineage members. Talent is usually measured by the maturation time, with faster maturation indicating greater power. The average is 10 to 15 years, and the quickest ones are ready in just one year, while Teratectra, for example, took 20 years. During the fight against Ragna, we discover that he doesn't have much talent as a lineage member, but he accumulated significant power during his time as a human. Using silverine-infused swords, Ragna lands several attacks on the enemy. After damaging the armor a bit, the blades get stuck in a crack in Teratectra's shoulder. A superior dragon then uses its own flaming blood to counterattack. Ragna acknowledges that the opponent is tough. He used all his power in the last strike, but couldn't cut off the dragon's arm. Teratectra praises the human strength, but Ragna refuses the admiration. Descending near the enemy, he releases one of the swords and takes off the glove from his right hand, determined to defeat this opponent in the next attack. Regardless of what the dragon will do, the boy intends to crush its magic and win, but he needs a high amount of silverine to do so. The problem is that his silverine battle art is dormant in his body for now, so he needs to create another power source outside his body, becoming one with the sword. The blade starts emanating an immense aura of power. Understanding the human's action, Teratectra prepares to use all its strength as well, intending to see which attack will prove superior in this showdown. Ragna then uses the Dragon Slayer attack, Flash of the Hunt, while the opponent uses the Seismic Cannon. The blows collide, causing an absurd shockwave. While this battle is taking place, Steria is using her power strategically, delegating power to others for greater utility. We see the arm team flying with silver pieces, as if they were the Silver Surfer. Ulta Zora is impressed with the aerial units. The twins use their enhanced visions to provide information on the enemy's positions, seeing kilometers away even at night. The mines report about the horde of about a thousand dragons surrounding the base and confirm that the total number of enemies is around 10,000, as predicted earlier. Further away is a more destroyed area where Ragna and Teratectra are fighting. However, they can't find Ulta Zora. 
In any case, all this information is impressive not only for their far-reaching vision, but also for their ability to communicate directly with anyone at a distance, updating the entire team on the situation outside. They mention that there are more than 1,500 humans in the area and two hordes are approaching the east entrance, totaling 400, possibly waiting for the brigade's attack. But for the princess, that doesn't matter because that's exactly what she wants. Meanwhile, Ulto Zora uses distant eyes to see the human situation, discovering that the first sent horde has been annihilated. The situation is tense for the soldiers who had to face the Zomify humans, but Steriev just wants a chance to vent her anger. This is when the impact of the attacks between Terratectra and Ragnet occurs. Ulto Zora is worried, but the armored dragon says it's okay, declaring victory while we see Ragnar fallen with Mr. Slime trying to wake him up. Regardless, it's astonishing that a human went head to head with Terra Tectra, who says that despite still being able to fight, it won't be able to use magic for a while after using the seismic cannon. Ulto Zora asks if there was Silverine emanating from the human's body, and Terra Tectra responds that if the opponent had such power, they would have used it. They conclude that this isn't the Reaper who tried to end the Progenitor, but Terra Tectra emphasizes that this enemy may still be on the battlefield, so they shouldn't let their guard down. At Ulto Zora's suggestion, he tries to take the opportunity to finish the guy off at once by stepping on him with his giant foot, but Ragna escapes at the last moment, surprising the dragons by still being alive. It turns out he survived by transferring the consciousness of his body from the human part to the sword part, so the battle is not over. Some lower dragons appear, whom the boy defeats in an instant. Terra Tectra says he's not as big of a threat now, and with a sufficient number of smaller enemies, he will be overcome and eliminated at some point. Before the superior dragon departs, Ragna, facing the inferior ones, asks him to wait and questions if they won't converse anymore through their fighting prowess. The big guy then says they've talked enough for him to understand that the kid is stronger than him. Well, he would be if the sword could withstand the power of his technique. Terra Tectra bids farewell, calling Ragna the man with no name, while receiving new instructions from comrade Ulto Zora, directing him to the princess's location. Ragna hasn't given up and starts cutting through the inferior dragons, trying to make his way to the superior dragon. The problem is, he's exhausted and heavily wounded, eventually dropping to his knees as hordes of inferior dragons keep increasing, until Shin appears and saves the guy by eliminating the creatures. Next, the soldier pulls Ragna by the collar and questions why he's on his knees. Garm also appears, prompting Ragna to ask why they are in the midst of enemies when they should be defending the base. However, the conversation is interrupted by a dragon attack. The warriors face off against some of these monsters. Now they continue fighting while the old man explains that they haven't abandoned the base. Most entrances have been blocked, so the only way for the enemy now is the north entrance, where Ike's team is, while the princess fights alongside 200 soldiers. Shin states that, considering all this, he and Garm came to help Ragna, but the guy insists he doesn't need them and tells them to leave. They continue facing the creatures while Shin calls Ragnar stupid for refusing help, but the guy just doesn't want people to keep going from the base in his place. Before finishing his response, the young man slips and falls from the back of the frozen dragon. Shin uses a powerful skill to get rid of several dragons around and approach Ragnar. The discussion continues with Ragnar insisting on doing everything alone and confirming to Shin that he wants them to hide while he takes care of things. So the Silver Brigade soldier takes a few steps back and says that in the last two days, he challenged Ragna 69 times and lost every fight, so now it's time for challenge number 70. He recalls a statement from the princess a few days before Ragna's arrival. She talked about relocating civilians out of the country and avoiding confrontation with superior dragons at all costs. Shin protested because he didn't want to flee the fight, stating he would eliminate as many dragons as possible because he wasn't afraid of losing his life in battle. However, Steria asked how many dragons he would defeat. He wasn't sure, but it would be as many as he could. With that, she asked if he could take down a superior dragon. This left him astonished and she continued, saying that no matter how many weak dragons he defeated, it wouldn't make a difference. What she needed was to deal with the superior dragons. If she could, she would barbecue those creatures, ending with a punch, stating that he talks too big for a short guy. She had mentioned he's still in the growth phase, so she said he could prove that if he survives this situation. The princess then addressed everyone, saying that after the escape, she would join the Solarians using their power to end the winged lineage and would need those soldiers by her side when the day came, asking them to follow her in this plan. Still in flashback mode, half a day passes and everyone thinks about what the princess said. Shin talks to a soldier named Yuga Robles, who says he has family in Donapieru, the first city attacked by dragons. It might be too late, but he has to go back there, so Yugo says that Shin must become the new master swordsman, even though the boy hasn't said if he'll stay or not. Yugo says that if he wants to become stronger, he needs to survive. 
With that, 120 of the 470 force members decided to stay in the country. In the present, while fighting with Ragna, Shin wonders if they are still alive and if they managed to protect something. He can't know, and in fact, it doesn't matter because he chose to escape. When the short guy finally surrenders to Ragna, the score changes to 69 to 1, marking his first victory. Then he pulls the guy by the hair to say that this is their battle, between those who chose to flee to survive and the dragons wanting to exterminate them. No matter how strong this guy is or the reason he fights, he can't just show up later and act like a big hero. Ending the conversation, the old man has already cleared the area around them. He starts boasting about wanting to get stronger, but Mr. Slime draws their attention not to lose focus because the eruption dragon escaped and they need to go after it. So they walk away, with Shin planning to hunt and eliminate the fifth seat of the lineage. Meanwhile, the princess creates a cage of magic barriers, questioning if Ulto Zora thought he would have an advantage in the forest where she can simply turn the forest into her territory. The twin is warned that the ground dragons have retreated and no aerial shooter was lost. On the ground, damages were minimal, and the soldiers remain willing to fight. With this small victory, the magic circle is doing well, mainly because they added a vertical dimension to level everything. For the princess, the biggest advantage is that they don't need to win, just survive to gather enough energy from the defeated dragons to use in the teleportation magic. The problem is that Ulto Zora has analyzed the princess well, both her extraordinary actions in this battle and what has been recorded about her. The dragon knows that she wouldn't risk the citizens' lives in a senseless battle, so he has figured out her intention, which is to use the magic absorption circle to take the energy from the eliminated dragons and use it for teleportation magic. Ulto Zora knows this because when he was part of the Solarians, they were studying how to use dragon energy in combat, and now he's seen the studies being successfully implemented. In short, he knows exactly the human's plan. Princess Daria possesses an incredible ocular ability. It's not any Byakugan, but she can perceive the aura emitted by all of creation. Dragons, however, lack this aura, but that doesn't mean Steria can't recognize these creatures. She perceives them as dark masses, contrasting with the natural brilliance of the world. Thus, she could identify the dragons. The problem is that the forest she's in has become draconic and everything around has turned completely dark. In this place, the princess can't perceive the movement of the dragons. As a result, the movement of people under Ulto Zora's control made her realize something was wrong. Steria notices a strange pattern in the movement of zombies and quickly understands that it's not random. The superior dragon already knows that only humans can be teleported within the magical circle's area, at least that's how he interpreted it. So the strategy is to have the zombified humans fill that area to increase the magic needed for teleportation since, in a way, they are still human. Thus, the princess's strategy is compromised for now. Despite these adversities, the princess prefers not to act clueless and remains resolute. An unnoticed dragon attempts a fire attack, but Steria uses a magical barrier to protect herself and her followers. Nevertheless, the power is impressive because it comes from a dragon that has lived long enough to become experienced. These inferior and median dragons can learn some of the spells of the mature dragons that created them. The princess asks if the Smekbers can aim from above, but the aerial support is occupied with several small tornadoes created by other dragons. To Ulto Zora, mature dragons are the perfect pawns of the lineage as dozens of elite hunters would need to unite to defeat just one of them, and at the moment, they have about 40. The superior dragon feels quite content with this situation. The advantage is clear. When Steria tries to attack a nearby enemy dragon, another smaller one uses a barrier spell to stop the attack. This protective barrier doesn't allow anything from outside to pass through, but it allows anything from inside to pass out without any problem. Meanwhile, Ulto Zora calculates that the magic absorption area of the circle is 2 kilometers, something that surpasses the magical capabilities a country like this could normally create on its own. Therefore, it's clear that there is something more behind all of this. The superior dragon recalls Nebula mentioning not seeing the face, but there was a woman with white hair and a black dress who used a magic perhaps more powerful than his own barrier magic. Despite being in the advantage, Ulto Zora is not counting on victory yet because several things have happened beyond expectations, and the tide can turn in an instant depending on what might happen next. After all, even if the battle is won, it would be a defeat for them if the princess escapes. There's the possibility of her realizing that there's no chance of victory and abandoning the civilians, activating the teleportation magic. For a definitive victory, they need to take control of the magical circle at the base. Meanwhile, Ike faces a complicated moment while defending the base. He realizes that all the soldiers on the front line were suddenly eliminated. He didn't even see how it happened despite keeping an eye on them the whole time. The current enemy is a white dragon with purple eyes, which when opened makes all magical defense grids disappear. The creature approaches, while Ike can only try to decipher what's happening. 
Regardless, knowing that even though small, this must be a mature dragon, Ike orders the men to fall back to the second line of defense and requests support from the marksmen. Only now does he remember a warning from Crimson about the monarch ultimation being able to control time, and that mature dragons would surely replicate this ability in this battle. That's exactly what's happening, and the creature not only stops time but also releases powerful energy bursts, wiping out several soldiers at once and knocking Ike to the ground. Not sure of what's happening, Ike doesn't know how to deal with this type of enemy, but remembers that the princess left him in charge of the base, so he starts going on the offensive, imagining that the dragon's power has a time limit. Otherwise, he would have been eliminated already. He also thinks that the creature needs some time before using the power again, so time to attack is now before the creature can stop time again. After a leap, Ike uses the sword to defend against some energy bursts and almost lands a precise blow, but the dragon manages to dodge, leaving only a silver mark on its shoulder. Before the monster stops time again, Crimson confuses it, appearing out of nowhere and making the creature think he is the monarch. The mage throws his spherical grenade in the air and still confused, the dragon decides to stop time. But this turns out to be its worst mistake since as soon as time stops, the magical grenade activates, emitting a good amount of sunlight, burning the dragon completely. With the creature eliminated, time starts passing again, while Ike and the others are confused and somewhat blinded too. Crimson explains the magical grenade, which is a weapon that emits accumulated sunlight, but this one was modified to explode automatically when it detected that time had stopped. And that's precisely what makes it so effective because with time stopped, the dragon continues to be burned by the sunlight as a normal grenade would just explode and end the effect immediately. The agony prevents the creatures from thinking straight, and they end up not being able to process what's happening. Crimson then mentions that to defeat an enemy that stops time is necessary to turn the static world into an unbearable hell. At least that's the simplest way. At this moment, Ike notices other people on the scene, who are the 1500 citizens who were under the brigade's protection. They told Crimson that they didn't want to stand still while the soldiers fought alone, so the mage felt touched and equipped them with weapons. But of course, with this redhead, there's always something behind it. These people are hypnotized and Crimson does the same with Ike and the other soldiers so that they think everything is fine, because the mage already knows that Ulto Zora has figured out the teleportation plan and placed the zombies in the circle area to double the amount of magic needed. Therefore, for Crimson, the best way out is to have the hypnotized face the zombify to reduce the number of humans in the effect area. Meanwhile, the 13th member of the lineage Urshkorun is tearing down walls in an attempt to bypass the barriers on the way to the base. However, he can't succeed so he starts shouting in frustration. Unluckily for him, the noise bothers Fu, who is dealing with stress due to insomnia. Fu prepares to launch an attack while recalling the conversation with the princess about needing nearly 18,000 lesser dragons to activate the magic. The number is concerning, but the guy explains that defeating medium or mature dragons would bring dozens or even hundreds of times more magical power to the circle. Finally, he informs that he will take a nap when the fight begins. Having said that, in the present, Fu defeats Urshkorun in the blink of an eye, using the power of his right arm, and absorbs all the dragon's magical energy. He feels satisfied for having taken down this enemy before losing control. The problem is that Majorica and the others start beating him up to regain consciousness, claiming that he had lost control of his arm. Apparently, it was just Majorica's plan to get rid of her colleague and take his place in the hierarchy. Meanwhile, Crimson is impressed with Fu's power and gains significant interest in the brigade wanting to take control of them with minimal damage. At this moment, the roots break down a few more walls and civilians defend themselves with the weapons provided by Crimson. Fu is confused by the presence of civilians and the weapons, but Crimson is more concerned about the pressure from the forest that is beginning to overcome the princess's barriers. They need to strengthen the magical circle's defenses or it will be the end for humans. In the forest, the battle continues intensely. The twins face the wind powers of the dragons and some of the shooters are knocked down. Meanwhile, down below, the little dragon who created the barrier is quite happy with the situation. However, the shield is soon broken from above, and the creature begins to worry until being heavily struck by a warrior. At this moment, Ulta Zora realizes there was a miscalculation. He didn't anticipate that the princess would dispatch her troops to break the shield with their own strength instead of continuing to shoot from a distance. Thus, he concludes that the more insane the commander, the more insane his men. In the meantime, a warrior informs Steria that they have taken care of the fire-spinning dragon, but the other one, the thorns, is not around. She suggests he is probably on the cliff. She is ready to dispatch the troops again when the wind dragons start attacking from above after overcoming the brigade's air force. Ulta Zora considers it normal for the princess to remain at a disadvantage due to her lack of experience in large-scale battles. In this case, 
She commanded the defense and attack with an overwhelming disadvantage without realizing how it could quickly exhaust her. Thus, it is proven that being able to do anything one focuses on can have its disadvantages. The superior dragon, despite enjoying himself, considers the party over. However, Teratectra warns about something about 300 meters behind him. Checking for himself, Ultazora sees Ragna and the others advancing fiercely, while Teratectra reports losing a third of the platoon. Of course, if they continue pressing for numerical advantage, they will eventually win, but the number needed to do so is larger than expected. Meanwhile, the guys keep advancing with no time to catch their breath. Garm acknowledges that they can't even get close to Teratectra due to the overwhelming number of enemies in the way. However, despite the circumstances, Ragman won't give up. He continues advancing with determination. Shin simply can't understand how the guy remains firm even in these conditions, almost crawling, but this serves as motivation for him to continue as well. Inside, Ragna is suffering a lot. He can't breathe, feels pain, cold, and the urge to stop, but he knows he can't give up now. He needs to hunt Teratectra, Ulto, Zora, and the horde of dragons to collect the magic. He wants to protect everyone on his own, so no one else has to lose their life. At this moment, he remembers what Shin said earlier about him, not being able to just show up at the end and act like the big hero. Those words hit Ragna like a punch in the stomach. Anyway, he felt somewhat relieved to hear that, but future Ragna considers it a weakness because he always survived, always was the only one to remain alive. So he thinks he can only stay with people whose deaths won't hurt him or who won't die either. When the three stop in front of another group of dragons, Ragna resumes fighting impressively, taking down all the creatures alone. As always, this surprises the other two as even with one foot in the grave, he continues with insanely effective techniques. At this moment, Ulto Zora realizes he made a miscalculation, but that's something that can happen on the battlefield from time to time, persistence. On the other hand, Ragna feels something strange, a sense of despair as defeat seems certain. This is common for future Ragna, and at this moment, more than ever, Ragna feels the proximity of his future self, and to him, that is like returning to hell. Ragna has already learned that the aura flowing through everything in this world does not flow dragons. Instead of this aura, they possess magical power, something beyond that alters this world, and that's why Silverine exists. The world created this power to resist the transformative powers of magic. While Ragnar reflects, enemies approach. With half a second left before the nearest target reaches him, he uses this time to refine Silverine's freezing ability. Ragnar then advances to launch the attack, knowing that he only needs one sword movement to defeat his prey. He also understands that Silverine's battle art is not the only thing that made the future Ragnar so powerful. There's also what he learned from experience, the ability to survive at battle. Imagination is essential. It's hard to accept that all this happened in just half a second, but let's assume the guy has an ultra-fast thought process. Next, Ragna moves the sword forward, and from the blade's tip emanates a large amount of silverine, freezing and eliminating all advancing dragons at once. He does all this with the thought that he only needs to mentally visualize the attack's result for everything to happen. And thus he remembers, while facing another group of dragons, that for him, moving the sword is like conjuring the image of a dragon-free future and bringing it into reality. Meanwhile, Teratectra also has his reflections. He knows that when enemies become persistent, they also become more resistant, spreading to others around. Ult of Zora agrees but says it doesn't matter how much they endure because the princess is already on her last legs as we can see. The poor thing needs protection because of her injuries. Steria decides to head northwest, so the blonde soldier picks her up and carries her on his shoulder. Besides knowing the princess's condition, Ult of Zora reveals that he sent Platinum Tyra to attack the base, the one that stopped time but he can no longer communicate telepathically with her, and Teratectra is also not hearing anything from Urshgoron anymore. Ulta Zora wonders if they were defeated while receiving information about the air squadrons being shot down as well. The most impressive thing for him is the base defeating the 13th seat and an elite mature dragon so quickly. Confirming that there are five minutes left for Teratectra's magic to recharge, Ulta Zora determines that this is the time the brigade still has to survive, he says he will deal with the soldiers outside and the ones who brought down the air squadron and asks his colleague to notify when he's ready. Teratectra asks if the companion is really aware of this situation because normally he wouldn't need his help to have a complete picture of the battlefield. And he may be rushing things. Anyway, the big guy's concern is for the princess and her men, so Ulta Zora reassures him, saying he will handle her. Meanwhile, Ragna makes a small mistake and sees that the last attack's effect was very different from what he imagined, so he needs to adjust the attack's form. The problem is that Shin suddenly appears and finishes off this dragon. Ragna is confused until Shin mourns that he's helping. Out of nowhere, Ragna says the short guy is right, remembering that he told him not to act like a hero and he was right about that too. 
He concludes that he shouldn't stop anyone who wants to hunt dragons and then apologizes, saying that Shin can fight as much as he wants while he will protect him as much as he wants. This still sounds a bit off the short guy, but Ragna says that fighting together means covering each other's weaknesses. So he moves forward and the others follow him. Ragna is internally fighting to overcome hell because, for him, the more he experiences desperate situations like his future self went through, the more he adapts to it. Therefore, he wants to overcome this hell to gain the power he has in the future. Shin, on the other hand, doesn't like Ragna's abyssal power, nor that he hid it until the final minutes, but what he likes the least is getting excited like a child with any sign of approval from him. Meanwhile, Garm already interprets that Ragna did not have a power growth, it's more like the dormant instincts of a formidable warrior are gradually being recovered. As he suspected before, this guy's powers were refined for a long time, and what can be taken from it is to observe and fight together to absorb and learn what is missing for his technique. In the midst of this battle, Mr. Slime remembers that Crimson only said to keep an eye on the idiotic human, so it should be a problem to eat dragons in the meantime. Everyone's excitement contrasts with the previous moments when everyone was hopeless. At this point, Ulta Zora decides to use more mature dragons. The first of the Tembro of Taft species has magic that affects the environment to use it to its advantage. It causes refraction in light and nullifies sounds and scents, in addition to generating force fields in the nearby air to step without leaving footprints and reducing gravity and air resistance for mobility. Basically, the creature becomes invisible and super fast, in addition to pulling prey with gravitational force. However, Ragna has no difficulty in finishing the creature when it's about to be devoured. Then he finishes off three more dragons of the same type. Holding the fifth, Shin asks why he doesn't leave some enemies for them, but Ragna only thinks about hunting all the dragons. At the same time, the short guy notices that Mr. Slime is growing. Now, Ulto Zora is almost entering despair because none of this makes sense. Not only did Ragna easily retaliate against those mature dragons, but it was like a technique he had already learned, so he is not only very strong. Meanwhile, civilians are facing zombified humans with firearms, which is also strange to Ulto Zora, not only because they are civilians, but because of the strange weapons he does not recognize, at least with the civilians' actions and expressions, he concludes that they have been brainwashed. This is very cruel and unusual, something the princess would not do, so there must be another person giving orders. The way of acting is similar to what happened in the capital when they used the best way to face Ultimatia, sacrificing civilians. Meanwhile, Crimson is taking control of the magic circle. After brainwashing civilians and seeing the amount of magical energy that Fu applied to the circle, the redhead brainwashes the other mages and hits Fu's arm to continue with his plan. Irritated by the way everyone blindly obeys, Fu asks what was done to them. Crimson scoffs, claiming he only turned everyone into friends while the guy recalls the princess talking about the large mass of death she saw in the redhead. The guy feels the princess was right. Understanding what's going on in the guy's mind, Crimson begins talking about good and evil, stating that the princess is a very logical person who quickly grasped the situation. She knew that no matter what she said, if the decision was to discard the civilians and flee only with the soldiers, most of the troops wouldn't follow her. Even if it decreases the chance of survival, soldiers need a purpose, which in this case would be to protect the 1500 citizens. Crimson continues saying that now, with most of the army under control and chaos outside, they no longer need such a purpose. To explain the reasoning, he says that wickedness would be sacrificing valuable people for the sake of useless people, which is exactly what's happening. Therefore, good would be the opposite of that. The redhead concludes that the citizens understand their own survival is bleak and chose to sacrifice themselves for the greater good. Fu strongly opposes brainwashing and magical hypnosis, finding these actions terrible. Crimson, being a mage, tells Fu that he doesn't need a purpose like soldiers and warriors do. He even apologizes for the arm as it was a precaution against the guy's surprising power. With the help of others, Crimson has already taken measures to transport only the troops, with a third of the gathered magic being sufficient. Now it's just necessary to activate it, but only Fu can do that. Crimson expresses a desire to befriend Fu for this reason. Meanwhile, Ulta Zora is certain that the person who blew up the capital is the same one manipulating the citizens. It remains to determine who the Reaper is. For him, there's a high probability it's Ragna. The superior dragon even considers calling Kamui, but, as Crimson predicted, he can't do that because the Reaper's power is too close to Kemui's, risking the possibility of the progenitor being taken to another dimension to be eliminated. It's precisely because Crimson knows Ulto Zora considers these details that he calculated his moves based on the fact that he wouldn't make inconsistent decisions. In the meantime, chaos is unfolding outside. Greya, one of the twins, is dealing with aerial combat when she's caught off guard. On the ground, soldiers continue advancing fiercely, even trying to calculate the enemy ratio. 
With Greya down, some dragons try to attack, but she fights back fiercely, even feeding on the dragon's flesh. Her sister, Hesula, also appears, and after recovering, they prepare to return to the battle. Back at the base, Crimson is flirting with Few and talks about gender, stating that whatever he thinks is right. Crimson enjoys appearing so androgynous to be loved by everyone since people are capable of killing for love or even sacrificing themselves for those they love. While Crimson talks about wanting people to love him, especially Fu, who has powerful absorption magic in his body, the guide gradually loses consciousness and almost enters a trance. Crimson was about to tell him to activate the circle when Majorca interrupts going against orders and calling Fu her brother. Crimson comments that they don't look like siblings, while Majorca is stopped by one of the hypnotized civilians who accidentally shoots at point-blank range. Fu tries to take advantage of an opening to retaliate, but Crimson quickly immobilizes him again. Now frustrated for losing the hypnosis link, Crimson tries a more aggressive approach, saying that he will eliminate one of the thaumaturges every 10 seconds, starting with the least talented. He begins the countdown, and the woman panics, thinking something is wrong because they drew the circle together and got along well. However, the countdown doesn't stop, so Fu surrenders, saying he will obey. At this moment, a bright light shines in the hall, Majorica undergoes a transformation with light hair and eyes. Crimson orders an attack, but the shots stop before reaching her. She declares her hatred for the redhead and orders him to leave. As she says this, Crimson and the civilians disappear, and Majorica falls unconscious. Now out of the trance, the other thaumaturges are desperate, apologizing and stating they didn't see the truth. They pledge not to trust anyone blindly from now on. The question now is what happened to Crimson, and Fu imagines that he was teleported, but has no idea where. Far away, Crimson finds himself falling from incredible height, understanding that he was teleported by Majorica. Just as absorption magic resides in Fu's body, teleportation magic resides in hers. Despite everything, Crimson finds it amazing because the brigade is truly full of talented people. The problem is that Crimson became too greedy with these things. Ulta Zora continues calculating the possibilities considering Walt Camus's absurd speed, he could leave the capital and reach the battlefield within two seconds. However, the telepathic communication of his lineage has a distance limitation, meaning he would need several medium-sized dragons to send any message to the capital, creating a kind of game of telephone. That would take at least 40 seconds to accomplish. Nevertheless, he has no intention of summoning Camus for this battle. Ulta Zora begins to wonder what the Reaper and the other person want with all of this. What is their motive for aiding the Silver Brigade? Besides luring Kamui into a trap, he believes there are two other reasons for their involvement. They might be trying to help the princess escape and find the will of the progenitor goddess. Or perhaps the Lumidic from the capital failed to use spatial magic for some reason and decided to join the princess to flee the country. But maybe the guy is just pretending he can't use magic to influence him to call Kamui, enabling them to return to the capital. Despite all these possibilities, the fact remains that the enemy seems to be abandoning civilians to expedite the teleportation. So it's a race between them teleporting and the dragons eliminating the princess first. Therefore, the priority now is to finish off Steria. Meanwhile, Crimson is all battered up after the fall. He hopes the teleportation will be carried out soon, preferably with talented soldiers. Moreover, for Crimson, it's even better if the princess is eliminated in this battle unless he can control her with Ragma's presence. These are Crimson's thoughts before losing consciousness. On the battlefield, some soldiers start performing well on the ground until they're hit by the dragon's wind from above, combined with the fire breath from the ground. It's at this moment that the blonde guy appears, carrying the princess and hurling an axe that hits three dragons at once. To motivate the troops, he delivers a speech, saying that was his best throw, and that he only managed to break a personal record while running in this situation because he got stronger during this battle. The man's logic is that every step they take exhausts them, but also every step taken and every dragon hunted makes them stronger. And that strength means they can take another step forward and hunt another dragon, meaning they can keep moving and get anywhere. The other soldiers comment that the guy is taking this no pain, no gain talk too seriously, but still, they agree that what's still helping them move forward is their willpower. Meanwhile, the twins are taking down several dragons in succession, and the princess notices this, pleased with her followers' efforts. The girl also remembers when she asked Crimson for help locating Ulto Zora despite it being a dangerous move. The mage helped identify the area where the superior dragon could be, saying he would be within a mile of the base, still on the border side. One piece of information that helps to be more precise is the battle between Terratectra and Ragna, as the dragon must see the guy as a threat and would probably drive the battle to gain distance from Ulto Zora. With that, the princess already has an idea of the enemy's direction. Moreover, there's also the fact that he can use blood to spread small vision organs to monitor the combat area, and under those circumstances, Crimson calculated that he could see about two miles away with this ability. 
With this information, the princess sharpens her senses in the direction and approximate distance to find Ulto Zora. But it's at this moment that he drives the dragons of this region crazy, or rather, crazier. Because according to him, the beasts were at 80% madness, and now they're at 200. This makes them much fiercer, easily dispatching soldiers, but it will also cause the creatures to disintegrate in a few minutes. Even in this situation, the princess doesn't give up and advances with the soldiers, jumping high to get closer to reaching Ulto Zora. After the jump, they'll still have to run a bit, but they'll be almost close enough for direct attack. Realizing that the princess has located him, Ulto Zora wonders if the other strategist won't make any moves. In this case, Crimson, but we know he's not in condition at the moment. Therefore, he releases a purple toxin, imagining that the opponent is preparing a big maneuver, but he finds it too obvious. In a brief moment, the superior dragon catches a glimpse of Lakusha, so Nazarene appears out of nowhere and takes advantage to launch a surprise attack while he's off guard. With the head kicked far away, the body speaks alone to the woman, congratulating her for getting so far without being noticed by his surveillance. Another mouth on the hand starts arguing with the body's mouth, while Nazarena tries to understand if this is a false body since she hit both the brain and the heart. Anyway, with her part done, she starts to move away to leave the rest of the princess. And speaking of her, the girl congratulates the tutor's work because it saved her from using her most powerful technique in the wrong place. Turns out, the body on the ground was indeed fake. Ulto Zora is actually a hundred meters underground. With this, she starts manipulating the earth to force the dragon upwards, trying to bring him to the surface, shining brightly as she struggles to make this move. Then she commands Chris's throw. At this moment, more crazy dragons appear, so the other soldiers prepare to defend the princess. As he rises, Ulto Zora thinks about his memories lacking color and how he can't recall certain emotions from that day with Lakusha, but now it's a bit different. Remembering part of the conversation, his memories are clearer now. This is because he saw Princess Silverware, who made him see how she sparkles with a bright light. The dragon also thinks about the danger, knowing he should eliminate the girl as soon as possible. But still, as he's about to see that glow even closer and probably gain a bit more color to his memories, he starts to hesitate. However, it's at this moment that Terra Tectric communicates again with his comrade, stating that the forest is compromised, the magic level is rising rapidly, and Ulto Zora must not let the dragons enter the forest. Suddenly, everything starts to tremble. The dragon-headed roots on the ground begin to attack everyone around, both dragons and humans. Ulto Zora can no longer control it and wonders if it's a scheme of the opposing strategist. However, as the heads are attacking the brigade, what must be happening is that the dragon Borgias is recovering its primary power. On one hand, Ulto Zora is angry about this, but he also imagines it could be a good thing, considering something strange was happening to him when he was being dragged upwards. He was about to do something crazy. At this moment, Ragna and the others appear, barely able to speak due to exhaustion but determined to continue fighting, as if they still had all the energy in the world, because all three of them want to become the strongest. Meanwhile, Teratector prepares to use the cannon, aiming directly at the trio. He fires six shots in a row, causing massive explosions at the same point. It was a direct hit, but he cannot confirm if he managed to exterminate the targets because the smoke and flames are blocking his view. The big guy notices that the forest seems a bit calmer and asks how things are. Ulto Zora then analyzes from various angles and ends up finding the fallen princess but lies to Terra Tectra, saying he didn't find her, but thinks she might not have survived, perhaps buried in the midst of all the confusion. Terra Tectra suggests making area shots to ensure casualties, but Ulto Zora tells him to focus on the guy who could be the Reaper. Not knowing why he's lying to his comrade, Ulto Zora also says that luckily, most of the Horde has left the forest, and they will quickly find the body considering the numbers. Then he forms the body near the fallen princess and begins to recall that from the beginning, he knew something was wrong. He was amazed that she was brilliant, disappointed that she was inexperienced, and excited to go to war for the first time in a long while. Even after realizing that the other strategist's garbage was lurking here in the shadows, Ulto Zora continued to focus on the princess. Now he questions if that was truly an impartial decision. He approaches the girl and recalls his past. He lived a life bathed in brilliance and wasn't like he is today. He had subordinates, companions, and the one for whom he would give everything, his sovereign lady. Everything shone in those times until the era of glory came to an end, and he was transformed into what he is now. However, everything he lost on that day is right in front of him at this very moment. Still facing her, Ulto Zora says it was a pleasure to have met the Silver Princess, Steria Lys, and that it was a splendid battle. He also sincerely respects the brave efforts of her and her troops. Now there's a flashback on the other side, with Crimson telling Princess Staria, accompanied by Ike and Nazarena, about Princess Lakusha, a heroic woman who enchanted many warriors with her innate abilities and charisma. 
She had many military achievements with her leadership, and even the Solarianos came to consider her a miracle of God becoming a dragon scourge. Upon hearing this, Steria says that even children know everything about her and always thought Lucutio was an imitation of her. Crimson then says that nevertheless, the world believes that Steria is the reincarnation of Princess Lucutia. Next, Crimson comments on the changes that occurred with Ulto Zora, that not even under the Bloodline's blood oath could he serve the enemy in his original form. Finally, the Redhead asks her not to give up the fight because her and the Trutsway will act like a slow-acting poison on Ulto Zora and drive him mad. Back in the present in the forest, the guy decides to make the princess part of the lineage. At this moment, she wakes up and realizes she's close to victory. Ulta Zora says her brilliance should not leave this world, so he will make the request to the monarch. Somehow, the superior dragon thinks this will solve not only their problems, but also the princess's troops. Still on the ground, she asks him if he knows why she shines so brightly. She answers that this world created the Silverine to be the desire of resistance. Therefore, the control she has over the Silverine means her splendor is the will of the world itself. Staria also says she wasn't a match for Ulto Zora as a general or a warrior. But that doesn't matter because if there's an area where she surpasses him, it's this magic inundated realm where the princess has a high desire for resistance, and she can shape it. Now more imposing, while summoning a giant silver weapon, the girl says her talent as a warrior or general isn't what makes her most proud, but the ability to forge silver weapons. She then strikes the weapon into Ulto Zora's chest, pinning him against a tree and freezing him and everything around. Even while frozen, the dragon can still speak and begins to say that the princess is delirious, perhaps from the toxin he released earlier. At this moment, two soldiers appear to take her away. After they move away, Chris approaches and pulls the weapon, saying they haven't lost yet. Steria communicates with the rest of the troops to motivate them to keep going while continuing to share her power, especially with Chris who concentrates everything on the spear and aims it at Terra Tectra, under the princess's command. Realizing this, Ulto Zora warns his comrade, who in reaction, uses the cannon to confront the weapon, creating a massive explosion and generating a huge amount of silver. Through the vast sphere of silver and smoke that emerge from the explosion, Chris's thrown spear pierces through, demonstrating everyone's determination not to give up easily. Ulto Zora emerges from the ground in a monstrous form, attempting to attack the princess, who is saved by Nazara. It's at this moment that the weapon hits Terra Tectra, piercing through him, but Ragna comes running right behind. Shin realizes he's trapped in a bubble and isn't sure what happened to him to end up standing there while Ragna continues advancing. The guy is frustrated because he decided to escape that day, but even during the escape, he can't perform well. When Ragna grabs the spear, Terra Tectra prepares to use the cannon, but the hunter employs a powerful hunting flash that resembles a Kamehameha, overcoming the opponent at once. Ulto Zora is disbelieving while Ragna falls onto the slime who praises the guy's performance. However, Ragna is more concerned because what happened was that Terra Tectra exploded at the moment of the attack, so he needs to act quickly. Meanwhile, Ulto Zora is in despair for losing his partner. He starts shouting for a response from his comrade who replies. Ulto Zora is happy, but not for long as the big guy warns that he won't last much longer. He avoided going down instantly when he exploded upon impact, but now he's on his last legs, unable to regenerate from damage at this level. Terra Tecture mentions that he swore to fulfill his duty without dying, but now he feels so pathetic that he can't express the remorse he feels for his progenitor. Ulta Zora denies all of this, saying that the real blame is his for not lying to Terra Tectra. so the big guy is suffering the consequences of Ulta Zora's actions. However, the partner says that no one can judge his actions. What matters now is that they prevail. Terra Tectra also states that it's not Ulta Zora's fault. He recalls loving Princess Lakusha like a warrior loves his lady, but Ulta Zora loved her as a man loves a woman. Despite everything, the big guy feels that he wasn't sincere enough in calling Ulta Zora a comrade, so he thinks these are the consequences of his lack of sincerity. Still, he can think of only one way for them to fulfill his mission, if Ulta Zora agrees. He doesn't know how to address the other if he can't call them comrade anymore, but still, Ulta Zora is the commander in this battle and must make the decision. With much agony, the dragon commander decides to send his partner to explode again, so that his sacrifice takes the enemies of the progenitor with him. Terra Tectra apologizes and bids farewell, while Ulto Zora moves away from the area. The big guy then concentrates all his power to cause a massive explosion, sweeping everything in its path. However, Ragna manages to arrive in time to stand between the explosion and the humans. He uses a continuous barrage of silverine to contain the explosion on his side, but the situation is not easy. In the distance, the soldiers notice the brightness of the explosion, and the princess reveals that Terra Tectra exploded and Ragna is holding the impact, warning that if he succumbs, this entire area will be devastated with no escape. 
The hunter resists bravely, while Mr. Slime also arrives to offer moral support. Ragnar realizes that he can't freeze this side of the explosion, but he can still gather more power. The problem is that the weapon is almost breaking. Observing from afar, the princess wonders if even Ragna has enough power to suppress this impact. Despite being worried, she feels that Ragnar is keeping part of his power in reserve. When trying to understand why, she concludes that it's because of her sword, and she begins to limb it, realizing that this must be the worst day of her life. The princess is on the ground, feeling completely defeated. Recalling that when she decided to fight on the surface, she had 200 soldiers following her, and they were being eliminated one by one. Now only a few are still alive. All others sacrificed themselves following Steria's orders, while she continued to be entirely overwhelmed by affliction several times. At this moment, she stands up, knowing that she just wanted to keep crying, but despite all this, she's not the type to leave her fate in the hands of another person, even if it's the man she loves. Now, much more determined, the princess says she will continue moving forward and will prevail. For this, she still asks for the support of the soldiers on site to take care of everything, while she projects her consciousness near Ragna. When the weapon is almost destroyed, the princess puts her hand on the sword with him and says she won't give up. Meanwhile, Nazarina and the others are protecting her static body from the dragons that still try to attack. Together, they don't give up, and Princess Steria tells him to use every fraction of his strength. The soldiers continue to fight bravely, including Chris with a sword in his mouth and Ike, now without glasses, shooting at the dragons. They encourage each other by exchanging insults, while the twins attack again from the air, Hesela using a firearm and Greya using her paralyzing scream. At the same time, the Arcanists continue working on the magic circle with full focus, the princess continues to use her ability to increase the strength of the sword, and Ragnar realizes that he's receiving the power from the princess's hand, while many people continue fighting, surviving, and dying just so that at this moment he receives the necessary support. The duo concentrates with full force, and the Silverine finally begins to create a freezing barrier to hold the explosion. Unfortunately, the barrier breaks again. Princess Sturia realizes that the energy of the explosion is now concentrated entirely in their direction, showing that even at the end of his life, Terra still has much tenacity, enough to be a deadly challenge for the princess. Nevertheless, she knows that this was to be expected as the dragon sacrificed himself for this attack, so he needed to make his life count. Seeing the princess's distress, Ragna tells her not to worry because they won't lose after coming so far. The two let go of the weapon. The guy says that inside him exists a sword. He wants her to help him, and in return, he will repay with all the power he possesses. In a way, Steria ends up internally seeing Ragna looking towards the future. It's a vision in which the future Ragna is on top of a frozen dragon, holding the massive sword. Emotionally moved, the princess lets a tear fall. At this moment, Ragna uses his Silverine Battle Arts attack, while Princess Steria uses her ability to activate Aura and activate Silverine to shape the Silverine form. With all the power being unleashed, Ragna reflects on how hunting dragons on his own is great and failing at it means being weak, dependent on others. But that's what he always thought until now. This time, Ragna feels his heart burning with flames. He clenches his fist and punches the sword, releasing so much energy that even Ulta Zora, at a distance, is astonished. The other soldiers also notice the immense power released at the location. Then we see that Ragna was able to use the freezing power to completely contain the explosion. The princess sees the future Ragna again and continues, shedding tears. He asks why she's crying, but she denies it, saying she's just amazed. She has realized that he only has so much power because of the future Ragna, and finds it absurd for someone so handsome to end up alone without any reward and without fulfilling any of his desires. To her, this is unacceptable. Ragna pays attention to the girl and ends up thanking her for meeting his future self. In turn, the princess says she should thank him for the help that made this victory possible. She formally thanks him and praises his last blow, which to her was super cool. Then, she regrets it, totally embarrassed for losing her composure. Nevertheless, she decides to go ahead, asking Ragna to give up the crimson trash and join her from now on because she guarantees she won't let him have such a miserable future. The girl leaves the proposal hanging, but also makes it clear that she won't accept a no as an answer. The princess's projection disappears, and Ragna comments that she is an amazing person. Again, he thanks her for surviving with him because they ended up saving each other. Then he collapses on the ground. The soldiers are relieved when the princess returns to consciousness in her body. In the meantime, the magic circle is already ready, so Master Few activates the teleportation magic. Lord Slime takes the opportunity to tell Ragna that he only won with his help, so he owes him eternal gratitude. The conversation is cut off when the teleportation magic light makes Ragna's body glow. Now Slime is worried because his body isn't glowing too. Everyone is very happy and relieved that the plan is working, but to end everyone's joy, 
The princess is hit in the neck by a fatal blow from Wolf to Camus. Then he puts her head back in place and starts acting tough. Ragna is amazed by the situation, so Camus attacks him, wonder force of fight. He tells the opponent to fight seriously with everything he has unless he has used up all his energy and now has nothing left, which in that case for Wolf to Camus is pathetic. The dragon says this is the end of the line and Ragna must prepare for his last fight. Meanwhile, Nebula warns Ultimation that Kamui has left, and the progenitor confirms that he went to the battlefield and Nebula shouldn't worry. She reveals that she is terrified of this enemy, a simple memory makes her tremble, but everything will be fine because she can't imagine for a second that the idiot Wolt Kamui would lose to such a weak enemy. The battle already begins fiercely, while Ragna has a flashback of Crimson talking about the Monarch of the Claw's lineage, which doesn't share blood. Instead, the monarch teaches battle arts to followers, whether they are dragons or humans. Those who achieve satisfactory proficiency receive from the monarch a demonic sword, one of the six claws and two fangs, totaling the eight most powerful demonic swords in the world. Those who have one of these swords are considered of the claw lineage. They are powerful warriors linked not by blood but by combat arts and swords. It turns out that one of them was eliminated and had the sword stolen by an outlaw, which was Kami when he was still human. That said, Crimson thinks he shouldn't face him, the guy was already an anomaly even when he was human. So if he's not an enemy that can be defeated with strategy. The strategy should be to avoid fighting him. Finally, the mage mentions that if Ragna ends up fighting Kamui, it should be after eliminating Ultimatia. In the present, still facing Kamui, Ragna knows that Crimson explained the reason, but now we can't remember, that's just what was missing. They exchange some blows, but Wolt Kamui shows that he has the speed of lightning, hitting several attacks in succession. Then they compete in strength with a double headbutt. Ragna still releases a large amount of silvering on Kimui's face, but the dragon instantly retaliates by throwing him away and changing to a shadowy form. From above, he hits another electric attack, and after sinking into the ground, Ragna returns for more exchanging of blows. Walt Kamui really seems to have the advantage until Ragna manages to block an attack and push the opponent away with an energy sphere. Then he concentrates silvering in his hand and pulls out another silver sword, but on the impact of the attacks, the sword breaks. Kenwi now shows his own stolen sword, the Claw of Lightning Skyrend. After this last attack, Ragna falls to the ground and can no longer move. Kenwi approaches, saying it wasn't even fun. The hunter does everything to move but can't until he hears the voice of Princess Steria calling him. When Ragna recognizes the princess and she confirms it's her, the guy starts shouting Silver Princess and touches her shoulders. He shouts like crazy while the girl begins to feel dizzy because of the sudden closeness of the man she likes. In reaction, she ends up executing a judo move to push the guy away. Besides complaining about the proximity, the princess says he should call her by the nickname Leah when addressing her directly. When Ragna obeys and calls her Laia, the girl sees him as a shining human sword and becomes even more enamored. Now that things have calmed down, the guy realizes they're in a completely destroyed place resembling a post-apocalyptic scenario. He asks where they are. The princess replies that it's the place they were teleported to. Ragna asks about the others, and she tells him to follow her. On the way, Saria asks what he thought of Garm and Shin's help. The guy responds that they saved him that both are very talented, and they became stronger during the battle. At one point, he ended up competing against them, able to unleash even more power from the future than usual. The princess is not surprised because they are the master swordsmen of the brigade. However, she also comments that Garm, not only because of age, but also because of skill, Thought he had reached his limit, but he ended up breaking that barrier when witnessing Ragna's strength, thus, all the experience accumulated over the years still enables him to achieve great feats. On the other hand, Shin is the most talented in the brigade, he would get stronger anyway, but having a rival, he wants to surpass further increases his growth rate, and maybe that will make him go further than he would in other circumstances. That said, the princess says it's not just these two, but everyone in the brigade is excellent, she kept an eye on Ike even before he joined the army. The man is very efficient, and without him, the brigade wouldn't be able to operate properly. Chris had a great importance in this battle, he seems like an idiot, but the girl thinks it's just an act, because when it comes down to it, he has moments of great intelligence. About Nazarena, the princess already knew she was very powerful, but it was still surprising in this battle. Few is recognized as a half-dragon thaumaturge who hates people, but he takes care of others well and is respected by subordinates. Also, his sister is in the group, even though he hides it. And finally, the twins, although they don't show much emotion, chose the brigade as their home and fought to protect it. After all this presentation about her followers, the princess suddenly stops and says that from this point on, Ragna must go on without her because Steria needs to forge a sword now. She wonders if it will come out of the head, the heart, or maybe the soul. 
She remembers that she has had the image of a sword inside her for a long time. But she can't distinguish the details, she only knows it's a sword called Silver Comet. As she utters these words, we see the image of a comet in the background. The princess continues, saying that a long time ago a silver star flew through the cosmos being the origin of all silver. And creating a sword that carries the name of that comet is the princess's reason for living, she says she will do it, even if it means going to the base, regardless of what happens, she intends to create a sword worthy of Ragna. Suddenly, the ground beneath the guy gives way, and he starts to fall, while the girl says that actually, all she wanted was for them to see each other one last time. Then Ragna wakes up in another place, all bandaged up again. In the same place, there are Chris and the team of mages. The guy leaves the place and finds himself in a camp, realizing he was inside a tent with the others. Outside, he hears the voice of Mr. Slime, who is trying to boost the morale of the humans, but in a very offensive way. When Slime realizes Ragna has woken up, he jumps on him happily because the guy is finally standing after sleeping for two days. He says all this while calling Ragna a stupid and idiotic human. At this moment, Ike appears and is also relieved to see that Ragna has awakened. He then invites the guy to meet a certain person. On the way, the Reaper asked about Shin, so Slime replies that the short guy left alone because he couldn't stand the morning atmosphere either. At this point, some civilians appear asking Ike how long they need to stay in the camp. When Ike replies that they will stay a little longer, one of the men says they are running out of food, a woman asks for medicine for her baby who has a fever. The soldier says he will bring the medicine later, but needs to keep moving. The complaints continue, but unfortunately, there's not much he can do at the moment, so he moves on. A little farther away, Ike explains that they managed to teleport 600 civilians, and there are several other camps like this one. About 80 brigade members survived, but few of them can move. As long as it continues like this, they won't be able to do everything that needs to be done. Suddenly, Ike realizes that Ragna hasn't eaten anything yet. He apologizes and decides to go back to get some military rations, but Ragna says he's more worried about Ike himself. Although he says it's okay, he reveals that he just wanted something, anything. Because if he stops at this moment, he thinks he won't be able to do anything else. So at least at this moment, he must act on behalf of the princess. With that, Ragna begins to talk about something he felt. But before he can start explaining, a girl appears asking if he's the Reaper. The hunter immediately recognizes the voice and face of Ultimatia and quickly lands a heavy blow that knocks her down instantly. The guy goes crazy but Ike manages to hold him, trying to explain that this is not the winged monarch. Suddenly, time stops and several other girls with the same appearance appear in front of them. They speak completing each other about how the Reaper is indeed very strong, which confirms the rumor about his battle against the winged monarch in the capital ending in a tie. They even consider going back in time a little because of the one who was attacked, but they decide it's not necessary because they still have several of them. The oldest of the girls decides to become the spokesperson instead. They reveal they are all identical, and the spokesperson comments on the Reaper's resentment toward the dragon woman who has the same face, but then explains that they are not the winged monarch, but the dragon scourge of the Solarian Church. And just like him, they want to destroy the dragons. At this moment, Ike bends down and pleads for forgiveness for Ragna, who is confused from just waking up, and because it was he himself who wanted to bring the Reaper to this place, he should be the one punished. However, Solariana doesn't intend to punish the guy. Furthermore, she believes that if what happened in Lys is true, Ragna must also be a miracle of God, since the value of one of them doesn't even come close to his value. On the other hand, Ragna starts to remember this detail that they have the same face and magic, but they're not dragons. But despite everything Solariana said, she ends up saying that she will grant Ike's request and punish herself after all, they are all miracles of God, too, and the loss of one of them shouldn't go unpunished. After vomiting at the sight of so many women identical to Ultimatia, Ragna asks that instead of taking Ike's life, they use the power of time to bring the other one back. The priestess confirms that she can do that, but it's something that consumes a lot of magical power, and it's not worth it for just one of them. With that, the Reaper then says that if they eliminate Ike, he will end each one of them. Thus, the spokesperson ends up agreeing and revives the companion, who soon realizes that she had died. The current spokesperson confirms what happened and asks if she should return to her position as Karula, then the revived one denies it because she doesn't know what happened while she was dead, so the other one should continue. Seeing this, Ike remembers that some time ago he asked the princess why she didn't want to become a dragon scourge. The answer was simply that she didn't want to become one of them. Now Ike understands that they are all lunatics. After that, they go to another place among the ruins, where Solarian explains that these are the ruins of a city from the ancient civilization, which the Solarian Church preserves. This place is protected by several layers of barriers that prevent dragons from approaching. At this moment, it is revealed that the priestess healed Ragna, but she couldn't do much because he has an impressive constitution, 
The guy is very resistant to magic, and the more he regains strength, the less effective the magic becomes, and thus, Soleriana only managed to save him from almost dying, but he still remains severely injured. Seeing the way she speaks, Ragna can only remember even more of Ultimatia, and this makes him nauseous again, having to ask the girl to cover her face. She understands that it's an uncomfortable image for him, as he hates the monarchs so much. It's at this moment that Nazarene approaches to serve everyone at the table. Ike seems uncomfortable, and when Ragna recognizes the woman, Karula explains that she is also from the Solarian Church. The Scourge explains that outside the territory of the church, people with special abilities are often persecuted, and to avoid this, the church sent agents to various places. In this case, Nazarena's mission was to recruit a potential miracle of God, who would be the Silver Princess of Lees to join the church. Basically, she had to gain the princess's trust as a tutor or as a private assassin, and when there was no more room for her and Lise, Nazarena would be the bridge between the girl and the church. But the woman failed and now awaits her own punishment. Ike asks if the princess knew about this because he always thought the two were good friends. Nazarena responds that it's hard to say what the princess thought, but she thinks that if the girl knew, she wouldn't forgive her. Having said that, she steps away after serving the tea. The Reaper refuses the drink, so only the girl and the slime drink it. Then, calling Ragna master, she invites him to be a dragon scourge. The guy immediately responds no, even though Karula says that his constitution seems very much like a miracle from the god of the sun, and it's this kind of people that the church is looking for. While the slime struggles on the ground after burning its tongue with the tea, the priestess mentions that the reaper's deeds in lease make him perfectly capable of becoming a scourge, and the benefits are very good. As a last attempt, she says they won't be able to receive the refugees from lease if he doesn't join the church. The girl also explains that the church has been encouraging the princess to become a driving scourge for years and she is committed to joining the church under the condition of receiving the refugees, but then the worst happened. When she says that if they only had the princess's head, they could have done something, Ragna notices a glint in a distant building. The priestess concludes by saying that since the princess couldn't make it to the church, they can't accept the refugees unless the reaper accepts the proposal. Ragna remembers the state of the people in the camp and asks why she didn't help the teleportation if she's so powerful. So she replies that person's value is determined by their achievements, and the princess was a candidate who should show adequate proof of being a miracle of God. But she couldn't, unlike Ragna who seems to have been chosen by the god of the sun. The guy says he doesn't care about that divinity, so Karula comments that everyone receives blessings from the god even without knowing, two examples being sunlight and silver. Angry, the reaper destroys the table asking why the god doesn't come down to destroy all the dragons. Without a response, Ragna says that the church will receive the refugees and in return, he will end the winged monarch. The girl approves the proposal while returning the tea to the cup. After all this, Ike apologizes for using Ragna as a bargaining chip, but the guy knows that he did what had to be done. Under the excuse of needing to go, Ragna steps away, accompanied only by the slime, but in fact, he goes to the building where he saw that glint where he finds Crimson. After being completely healed in a laboratory, Ragna recognizes the place and asks if he was fixed, so Crimson explains that the base has self-repair capabilities, otherwise Ragna would never have been forgiven. Additionally, since he had nothing to do for the past two days, Crimson also advanced the repairs and even reconnected the base to the surface of the moon. In another part of the base, Ragna sees Chimera and greets her, but she says she doesn't know him. The Golem also speaks up, saying he's in this place too, but he can't be seen, yet Ragna already states that he doesn't like him. The slime then tells everyone to be quiet because they're in the presence of Master Crimson, who mentions that he learned the details of the battle and talks about the princess's death. The redhead says that's bad, but there's nothing they can do, so they should just be grateful that Ragna is still alive. Crimson also mentions that the Battle of Lease is over, and although they didn't win, they gained some benefits, so from now on, they will work to create a combat force centered around Ragna. The next step will be taken within three years when the restoration of the Glow Chamber is complete. For Ragna, the battle is not over because Ultimatia still lives, but Crimson says that at the moment the chances of victory are low, and if Ragna wants to ensure victory, they need to prepare and wait for the right moment. Ragna, as impatient as ever, says he wants to win now. Understanding what's going on, Crimson says that winning earlier won't bring the Silver Princess back. He then mentions that several members of the Silver Brigade survived, and they could fight alongside Ragna one day, which would make the soldiers stronger and everyone would avenge the princess. At this moment, Ragna reveals that the princess is still alive. Crimson finds this impossible, but Ragna explains that at the end of the battle, they connected deeply through their auras and he still feels the connection even on the moon. In the madness of battle, he hadn't understood, but now he finds it strange how things happened. After the attack, Wolta Kamui put the princess's head back on her neck, 
and it stayed in place as if it were a magnet, but Ragnar doesn't know why Kemi did that. Still, Crimson doesn't think this proves that the woman survived. Ragna then regrets usually letting people monopolize the conversation when they start talking because he should have told the soldiers from the beginning that Steria is still alive. He wants to see her again. Finally, he asks Crimson for help because the battle is not over yet. The mage says he can't act on something so doubtful and when Ragna says he's sure of what he's saying, the redhead also comments that Ragna can't defeat Walt to Kamio. The issue is that the enemy has time control magic, Kamui and preparation on their side. Just to counter the time control, they would need the element of surprise, but they don't have that now. Ragnar insists on dealing with Kamui while Crimson would deal with Ultimatia, because being the former monarch, Crimson can surely do something. But the redhead says he would need time to prepare for this something, and there's no reason to fight at the moment. However, Ragnar thinks the princess is reason enough. She's an amazing person, and they also need her to destroy the dragons. Crimson disagrees because they already have Ragnar himself. The combat unit centered on him would be the greatest force of dragon destruction when armed with Silverine on Ragna. Of course, the princess would be a great asset if she were present, but it's not necessary. For Crimson, with Ragna strengthening the troop and him commanding, the princess is not a resource worth risking a battle with so much disadvantage. Finally, he says that Ragna swore to destroy the dragons with him, not the princess, and the hunter must follow him to survive. Ragna doesn't quite understand what he means by survive, so the former monarch explains that the hunter is still alive purely by luck. By chance, he ended up being the only survivor in each battle, basically being carried by a miraculous wave of coincidences. But his next action could be when luck runs out. Upon hearing this, Ragna thinks of all those who perish around him while he survived alone, finding it weird that this is luck and not a curse. But that's what makes him decide not to rely on luck anymore. He will make everyone survive because he now understands why he wants to fight. It's not for revenge or fear of losing things, but because he wants everyone to survive and laugh together. Therefore, he decides not to ask Crimson for help anymore. With the hunter determined to go alone, the golem comments that telling the brigade that Steria is still alive will make them return to Lys, where they will fight a battle with no chance of victory, meaning Ragna would be sending them to certain death. Obviously, that's not what Ragna wants. He remembers Shin and the other's willpower, so he says that even if that happens, it wouldn't be his fault. With that, Crimson realizes that he messed up and there's nothing more to do. At Ragnar's request, he summons the door that leads to Earth but warns the guy he will regret it. Suddenly, the hunter feels the effect of the poison he took earlier, which would only take effect if he rebelled against Crimson. When the guy falls flat on the floor, the redhead comments that a tool that cannot be used must be broken and reproposed. The golem is amazed by the scene, but Crimson is calm because he only needs Silverine's battle arts, and he can recreate that power in another person using Ragna's body as a research object. Furthermore, he can use the brain to make a zombie. These crazy ideas make the mage laugh, but it's at this moment that Ragna wakes up. The guy is alive, just a little dizzy, so he thinks it was all a bluff by Crimson. However, the former monarch was serious, and now he panics because the gene-destructive nanobots controlled by artificial intelligence have nothing to do with magic, so they should have killed the hunter. Even though he's kind of sword, he should be at least half dead. To calm the mage, Ragna pats him and ends up exerting too much force and throws him away. Then the guy asks why Crimson's words don't motivate him. While Shimura tries to hit the hunter, he talks about a memory from the future when they first met. Future Ragna immediately eliminated Crimson, but found it strange that he didn't have a heart. The hunter asks where the heart is, mentioning that the words and actions of the brigade members keep him motivated and moving forward, surely because everyone risks their own lives, but Crimson is different. He always has a plan for the next time. Anyway, the chances of victory at the moment are low but not zero, so if Crimson can't accept the challenge now, Ragna asks when he will eradicate the lineage. The redhead makes the Chimera stop attacking and tells Ragna to follow his path and do whatever he wants, then he self-destructs and moves on with a new body to rest. With this situation, the slime becomes sad and starts to cry. On the ground, the Reaper finds the soldiers they already know that the princess is alive because of Kriz arm that he can only move through the connection with her power, so since he can still move it, they already know the truth and are willing to go rescue Steria. In the meantime, Kamui is indeed with her. The girl asks why she's still alive, so he explains that the head obviously reconnects when it's put back right after the cut. Then he shows a mark on her neck and says that if the Reaper or any of his companions get close to her, or if she leaves the capital, she will be based instantly. Anyway, her life has only been prolonged a little but not for long because Ulto Zora is resentful for having lost his comrade. Regarding the battle, the princess discovers that Kami was already at the scene. He says he was just planning to take a look, but ended up getting entertained. 
At that moment, his arm dissolves into silver and his body begins to crack, so Kamui rebuilds the body with a burst of electric power and says that the Reaper left a beautiful scar on him despite having rebuilt his own body several times. That's why the princess is still alive. Walter Kamui wants to fight the Reaper again, but with him in his best form, and he knows that the princess can help the guy overcome his own limits. The girl mentions that she's going to die anyway when Ragna arrives, so Kamui confirms and says that for this reason, she has to make a sword for the Reaper, one that can go head-to-head -head against his claws. Meanwhile, Ultimatia prays, swearing to destroy God's enemies and recover his power, and asks him to speak to her again when this happens. Without announcing himself, Borgius appears in his new humanoid body and asks what God said to her. The monarch comments that she's not used to this new appearance of his. The elder then says that he's still getting used to having his own arms and legs and having a young appearance. Next, the girl asks about the enemies. Borgius replies that Zora has already discovered many teleportation circles around the city. Speaking of Zora, Borgius thinks he'll only regain sanity after avenging Terra Tectra and maybe not even then. We see then that the strategist is really out of it when he realizes that the sun hasn't risen. Upon receiving the information, Borgius goes directly to Nebulum to warn that the sun disappeared out of nowhere. Nebulum says it's alright he did it. As he's in the place created by the former monarch through the manipulation of time and space, he managed to create an area of eternal night throughout the capital himself. The young man then apologizes for not asking permission for this because he ended up getting carried away. Borgius recognizes that Nebulum has an invaluable talent and praises the young man a lot, saying finally that he can leave him in charge without any problem. He mentions that the former monarch was very cold, unlike Ultimatia who cries for them and shows true feelings, so Nebulum must take care of her for him. Meanwhile, Woltekenmu recalls his own story. His mother was electrocuted during childbirth. People tried to capture or get rid of him, so he eliminated everyone. Time passed as he wiped out people and dragons, accumulating power, skill, and weapons until he was complete. But it's not enough, he's fascinated by the Reaper's strength. Eliminating an opponent like that for him must be like surpassing even God's power. Staria is already preparing to forge the most powerful sword in the world. Far away, Ike urges Fu to prepare the portal soon. The Thaumaturge says it will be ready by morning. The soldier takes the opportunity to ask about the circles in the capital. So Fu says he prepared them by order of the princess. It was a contingency plan when the new district was being developed anyway. Only magical power is missing for the teleportation to be ready. Ike then gathers the others and goes to Soleriana, who agrees to help them with the necessary magical power. In return, she asks for the formula of the magic circle and a little blood from Ragna, Fu, and Majorca. Finally, the priestess said that despite half of the winged lineage being exterminated, their main battle forces still remain. With this, Ragna says they will hunt Ultimatia, but if she perishes, the lineage will go with her. In the meantime, Crimson is in bed agonizing over what happened, he's angry at the way Ragna talked about risking their own lives. At that moment, the redhead also learns that Borgius plans to sacrifice himself. With this, he activates a satellite display to observe the capital. Realizing that the enemies seem to be acting hastily, the mage already gathers the servants and orders them to prepare for battle, because he realizes he can use Ragna's attack as bait for them to catch Ultimatia. With the brigade gathered, Ike worries about asking if everyone's well-rested, and they throw the question back at him because he's the one who was sleepless. But thankfully, Chris knocked the leader out to rest with a good beating, so everything's fine. Now, onto the mission, he mentions the information Nazarena brought after stopping by the capital about five hours ago. The situation is terrible. Not a single citizen survived, and there's a giant tree absorbing nutrients from them. The new district and the old district are in ruins, but on the other hand, a palace district is strangely intact. Furthermore, Nazarena herself comments that she felt an increase in silverine in an area of the palace district. To her, it was the light of incorporated restrictions, so she believes the princess is in that place. Upon hearing this, the brigade starts to celebrate. Ike then comments that the monarch must be there too, so the mission is to rescue the princess and eliminate the monarch. At this moment, he recalls Nazarena's reports that the enemy probably already discovered the teleportation circles because they have a very efficient surveillance network, but still, she managed to infiltrate. The question is, if the enemy has such capabilities to maintain such an efficient surveillance network, how would they have lost sight of a circle that was already there through which she infiltrated? This leads everyone to conclude it's a trap. He doesn't even need to tell the others, but they need to fight, as there's nowhere else to go. Despite having four superior dragons left, Soleriana says that just by eliminating the monarch, who is the heart of the lineage, the rest will fall together. That's what's in the scripture. Ragna, hidden in a corner, says he doesn't care about such scripture. But he confirms it's right, and that he'll deal with Wolt Kamui, while the others hunt the monarch. 
Shin questions why the guy is hiding in that corner and Ragna responds that he doesn't like being the center of attention. The short guy then starts teasing him about everything that happened on the battlefield. Meanwhile, Ike discusses strategies with Soleriana. Regarding time control magic, Karula says that power isn't exclusive to the monarch. As for civilians, the church will be responsible for them. At this moment, Chris tells Hizala she should stay because she doesn't seem to be in a condition to fight. However, she says that after losing her sister, she doesn't even know what she should be feeling, so she's going to fight. Ike tells everyone to get ready to leave in two hours, when the sun will be rising in the capital. The swordsman Garm takes the opportunity to talk to Ragna. The old man asks if his body has already healed because even Ike mentioned that the Reaper went to take a dump and somehow came back completely recovered. To cover it up, Ragna confirms that it was indeed what left him renewed. Without questioning, Garm challenges him to a duel just to practice. While the old man has the sword in hand, Ragna uses his own hand as a weapon. They exchange two blows quickly, and in an instant, the boy overpowers the swordsman. They exchange compliments, saying they've both gotten stronger since last time. However, the old man mentions that it actually seems like Ragna is just getting used to a strength he already has. Impressed, the boy shares excitement that the swordsman noticed that. He reveals that all this strength isn't exactly his. He just received it without working hard, and yet people treat him as someone amazing, but it feels wrong to him. It's hard for him to be proud of his power. Putting that conversation aside, the old man asks about Mr. Slime and Ragna says he must still be pooping. Garmin talks about the Terratectra's attack, where Ragna made Slime protect him in Shin, but he dodged to go after the Reaper and ended up seeing him cut through the explosion, which wasn't just magic, it was heat, impact, and even sound. The old man comments that Ragna could have gone straight past, but chose to stay and face the attack, protecting those behind him. Seeing that Garm decided to imitate, it wasn't against such a powerful attack, but it was quite complicated, and he managed to do it. With that, he finishes by asking Ragna that even if he feels alone and isn't proud of himself, he should continue leading them and showing his strength because it will make many people overcome their own limits, and maybe some can reach his level. Obviously, Garm intends to be the first person to achieve this. Ragna thinks alone about a future where many people become as strong as him. That future would be great. The time comes for everyone to leave. Majorica was drugged so she wouldn't wake up and want to go along with the teleportation. Of the mages, only few will participate. The others are worried and sad, wanting him to join the church with them. But he wishes only to serve the princess. He walks up to the circle and activates the magic. The red light shines on the floor drawings. Meanwhile, the Solarians use another magic that brings a golden glow to circulate all the soldiers. This is the measure against the time-stopping magic. Karula explains that this will give them three minutes of stop time, but Ragna is exempt because it wouldn't affect him. As she speaks, her appearance begins to age. She explains that this is what happens when using this power in a human form, but as the goal of the Solarian Church is to help those fighting against the dragons as much as possible, they give their lives willingly. When the brigade arrives in the capital, the mark on the princess's neck is indeed activated, and Kemu already realizes the enemy has arrived. They fall through a golden glow in the sky, and Ike already notices that the sun isn't rising. Near the tree, Borgius starts an attack using giant serpents, but is stopped by Zora who wants to imitate Terra Tectra and protect the progenitor to the last breath, so he wants to deal with the enemies alone first. As he speaks, Ragna hits him with three swords, but doesn't cause much damage. When Multikemi reveals himself, Ragna goes straight for him. As he heals from the three silver wounds, Ulta Zora tells Borgias to prepare for the trash that will take advantage of this opening. Nebulun feels like something is approaching, but doesn't know from where, maybe from above. And really that's when Crimson realizes that time hasn't stopped yet, and knowing that the best use of this ability would be to freeze time as soon as the enemy appears, Crimson concludes that they can't use that power right now, so it's time for action. The redhead sends a Megazord plummeting through a spatial connection at high speed. Nebulum is impressed to see the portal, and not only that, he sees that it's not a living creature. Following the strategist's advice, Borgius uses the serpents to attack the mecha with rays fired from their mouths. Ragna notices that Crimson has appeared as he had expected. The armor passes unscathed through the attacks, and after reaching the ground, begins to hit the snakes with freezing silver shots. Chamorai is also on the battlefield now. Borgius starts to fly and puts more snakes into action but this time raising the tree and joining them to form a giant dragon from the trunk and roots, cocky. He says he doesn't intend to interfere in the fight, but now that he's gigantic, he won't be responsible if he accidentally steps on someone. Walter Kamui and Ragna stare at each other until the Reaper notices Starlia's body on the ground. Anxiously, he runs to her and Kamui steps back a bit to let the opponent say goodbye. 
Nearly at his base, the girl recognizes Ragna when he holds her in his arms. At that moment, Ulta Zora warns that the princess will die soon, and even if he is eliminated, they can't stop the effect of the poison. He's doing all of this to vent his anger. Then he appears behind Ike and defends himself from three attacks at once. After saying he'll make them suffer the same agony he's feeling, Zora sends the three opponents flying away while transforming. As for Ragna, he wonders what to do for someone who's dying. The princess calls him by name as he tries to imagine the possibilities of how he could help her, perhaps the church or crimson, but there's no time for anything. The girl then tells him to pick up a sword lying on the ground. Just by seeing the object, the reaper remembers the story the princess told about the silver comet that crossed the cosmos long ago, the origin of all silver. So he recognizes that this is the silver comet sword. The girl then apologizes, saying that Ragna fulfilled his promise, but this was the best sword she could make, which is a failure because it's not enough to stand up against Kamui's demonic sword. Coughing heavily and with tears in her eyes, the girl still says that next time she will forge a sword worthy of being used by Ragna, but there won't be a next time for her. The Reaper is apprehensive because he wants both of them to survive and laugh together. But if that can't happen, he doesn't know what to do for her before she passes away. At that moment, he remembers what Garm said about continuing to show his strength to others. Determined, he tells her to pay attention and tells her that he felt her constantly before arriving, and he feels her even more deeply with the sword in hand. Thus, he says that this is a good sword, and he will win using it against the demonic sword to hunt Woltakamu. Even if Starlia can't see him, he will shine so brightly that she will see him as clear as day. When Nazarena approaches to hold the princess, he backs away, thinking that if she dies, he will mourn, but he will also be happy to have known her. So now, he just wants her to watch until the end. The hunter then takes off his coat and ties it around his waist, determined to become stronger than future Ragna. Soon Kamui descends to face Ragna, realizing that the farewell is over. The Reaper tells him to hurry up and turn into a dragon while Walt Kamui says he wants to continue from where they left off last time. Like a good villain, he takes the opportunity to give us some information, saying that this claw he uses changes its own characteristics to suit the user, so it only became the lightning claw when he grabbed it. Its power is expansion and transformation at lightning speed. As he says this, he's already transformed into a demonic form and the sword is becoming gigantic. The power generates electrical discharges around Kamui and destroys much of the ground. The Reaper doesn't care about all this talk and showing off from his opponent. Finally, he prepares an attack with the demonic sword and fires it, saying he's attacking with everything. However, the hunter holds the attack with one hand, instantly freezing Kamui's power up to his arm. Then he advances quickly and hits the opponent, leaving him without an arm and a leg. Even so, Walt Kamu continues to smile. As promised, Ragna now begins to shine brightly, illuminating the princess. As the Reaper tells the enemy again to transform into a dragon quickly so he can defeat him in his most powerful form, the Silver Comet transforms as well and shines even brighter. As he regenerates electrically, Kamui laughs like a madman and compares the weapons. While the Lightning Claw is a sword that reaches 100% in the user's hands, Ragna's sword elevates the user to 120%. Taking back the weapon, he finally goes into his final form, transforming into a dragon. Ragna now observes seriously, and the two stare at each other for a while, with the silver slash blue glow of the silver comet and Ragna contrasting with the golden glow of Kimui's lightning and the lightning claw. The snake heads begin firing energy blasts from their mouths, but they can't hit either the chimera or the armor, and end up getting hit by silver shots, while some missiles hit the transformed Borgias. Still, the dragon keeps attacking with energy rays. Chimera then starts complaining because despite dodging all attacks, the mecha isn't causing much damage to the enemy, but that's because its main weapon can't be used in this space. Meanwhile, Walta Kamui and Ragna use their powers against each other, causing great destruction to the surrounding terrain with the impact of their energies. Nazarena dodges the debris carrying the princess in her arms. Seeing this, the Reaper sends one of his swords in their direction, helping Nazarena gain more speed, and also destroying part of the debris. The power struggle continues until the hunter leaps and reaches Kamui's face to land a powerful silverine attack. The dragon is thrown away but stops in mid-air and heads back towards its opponent. They wrestle for a brief moment, then Kamui hits Ragna with its tail, and as the guy falls, the dragon advances downward, nearly hitting him with its blade. Then they exchange a few more blows, still, in a balanced fight. Nearby, the Chimera admits that, like the male counterpart, she also wouldn't be able to inflict much damage on this giant dragon. Due to a careless move, the armor ends up colliding with Wolt Kamui and loses one of its arms before falling to the ground. When the giant Borgias prepares a powerful energy attack, Ragna uses a silverine attack that freezes the red ray and pierces the enemy's head, freezing even a part of its neck. However, the Reaper is hit and thrown away, exiting the dome. 
When the robot realizes the Borgius' situation, it tries to take advantage to attack the vulnerable enemy. However, two more dragon heads sprout from the giant body, while the frozen one falls off. The giant dragon shows no mercy to the enemy and immediately launches a double attack. Meanwhile, the brigade soldiers advance towards Ulto Zora, who was also transformed and launch a spike attack at the approaching enemies. To protect themselves, the humans lift a very large rock from the ground, using it as a shield. Seizing the moment, Old Garm appears from behind and lands some blows on the dragon, creating an opening for Shin to attack and freeze Ulto Zora's tail just before being knocked down by a stone. The superior dragon now feels a bit apprehensive that perhaps is being surpassed, realizing that even after losing the Silver Princess, the humans seem to have become even stronger, especially the Elder, who at this moment jumps among the debris and continues attacking the enemy. The dragon starts to take flight, but Hezela uses her sonic attack, and once again, the swordsman hits it, destroying one of its wings. Ulta Zora, despite being surpassed, remains confident because it has been releasing an odorless and tasteless toxin since the beginning of the battle. So without the princess's protection, the troops will soon succumb. However, it's at this moment that it realizes Fu absorbing all the toxin through his arm. The superior dragon then projects an attack to stop him, but Garm appears, repelling the blast and cutting off one of its arms. With the beast down, the humans remain focused and go after it until Chris's metal arm falls to the ground, indicating that the princess is already at her limit. Ulto Zora mentally invokes Terra Tectra and asks how his comrade could fight so fiercely, as he would like to be more like the former companion in his final moments. The dragon then starts to change shape again and becomes even bigger. With an attack on the ground, it sends several humans flying away with just the shockwave. Worse still, Garm was directly hit, being cut in half. Meanwhile, the battle between Ragna and Kamui continues fiercely. The dragon once again knocks the Reaper to the ground, but this time it pins the guy with its blade and prepares a powerful energy shot. The hunter frees himself in time to hold off the attack with one hand and counterattack with the other in the shape of a sword, dissipating the blast and nearly hitting the opponent, who holds the blade between his hands. Still, the guy keeps pushing the enemy upwards with his power until they reach the stratosphere. They stare at each other and resume attacking. From the ground, Nazarena sees the opponent's lights clashing in the sky and comments to the princess that it's a very beautiful sight. At that moment, Starlia says that the tutor shouldn't be wasting time with someone who is about to die and should just leave her. Seeing the girl in this state, the woman has a flashback to when the princess was a child and she introduced herself for the first time as her tutor. The girl was dismantling a bear with her telekinesis and seemed like a wild animal with many broken things in the room, and upon noticing the woman in the room, she began firing several wooden pieces at her, but Nazarena shows her incredible agility by stopping all the attacks with her hand. Then the woman begins to speak about royalty being a bloodline guaranteed by sovereignty through divine right, meaning the royal lineage is exalted flawlessly, and it's impossible for someone of royal blood to be born with physical defects, logically thinking. Normally, the girl would have been considered stillborn, but what saved her was the hope brought by her peculiar abilities. Suddenly, Starlia starts growling, so the woman tells her to stop acting like a wild beast that doesn't understand what she says because Nazarena knows she's intelligent, she can manipulate the auras emitted by creation, and if she wanted, she could tear a person in half with a simple thought, but she understands that one shouldn't do that because it would ruin the chances of being accepted by others. Nazarena says that's a smart decision, and it's at this moment that the girl speaks for the first time to the woman saying she doesn't want to be accepted, but revered. With that said, the tutor begins to impart her vision of how she should behave to show her worth, starting with etiquette. In the present, Nazarena bids farewell to the princess as she walks away. Meanwhile, Nebulum starts to feel Crimson's intrusion. The dragon knows the mage is going to try to take control of the alternate space where the progenitor is now. We then see Crimson casting a spell while preparing a jutsu with his hands, all of this to infiltrate the computer system as if he were a magical hacker. Nebulim begins to despair because he has nothing he can do to stop the intruder. He then remembers the last encounter with the Elder and claims to the thought that Ultimatia is counting on him. The problem is, whenever Nebulim achieves any result, Mr. Smile swallows him. Crimson arrives in the dimension where the monarch is and points a gun at her. The progenitor only realizes something is wrong when she hears Nebulim scream from the other side trying to warn her. Crimson fires a shot while the slime continues the feeding process. Fortunately for the dragon, the projectile only hits her shoulder, so she retaliates against the enemy with fire, but Crimson manages to escape and aims back at her. Ultimatia recognizes the enemy as he makes modifications to the dimension's control, using spatial manipulation to set the existence condition of this dimension to must have the status of the winged monarch, and time manipulation 
to set the passage of time at one-third of the speed of time outside, ensuring no interruptions. Even if the monarch recovers her magic, it won't affect anything outside of this dimension. When Ultimatia realizes that the wound isn't healing, she recalls Kembley's advice, and instead of being afraid, she gets angry and prepares for battle. In a flashback, Crimson remembers when he prepared to put his heart back. An image of his monarch version suddenly appears and questions this decision, reminding him of the self-imposed rule that he must discuss the matter with an objective version of himself when making any important decision. Other versions appear to question the situation, but Crimson is convinced that he needs to act now to make his previous moves worthwhile. The girl version asks it is worth doing this for that mediocre man, referring to Ragna, but for Crimson, that had already been decided. The issue is that with his heart back, he won't be able to recover even 10% of his power, so it's smarter to leave the heart and fight as an immortal. However, he thinks that with such a limited existence, he wouldn't be able to eliminate someone with such a monumental existence as a monarch dragon. On the other hand, even restoring such a small percentage of his power, he is sure he could defeat the newcomer. Back in the present, we see Crimson and Ultimatia fighting transformed. Crimson dodges some attacks, prepares solar grenades while the monarch retreats into an energy shield and fires a shot that apparently doesn't have much effect. But it turns out that this ammunition was created by Crimson to self-destruct, disrupting the blood flow and rendering the magic useless. Since both use time control magic, the blood flow is similar, which is why it also works on the monarch. Since there were 12 bullets in the magazine and two were used, now there are 10 left. Crimson knows that if at least one hits Ultimatia's heart, victory will be guaranteed. The mage then speeds up the shots but only attacks when some grenades distract the opponent. However, he doesn't hit the heart, only a wing. At least that's enough to knock the progenitor off the platform. Crimson then follows her in the fall, determined to adjust his aim for the next attack. However, as he prepares for another shot, Ultimatia, desperate, creates a giant luminous sphere. Outside, the sun is finally rising, but Ultazora doesn't seem weakened. He attacks fiercely and throws Chris away against a building. He then attacks the other soldiers, ending several of them in sequence. Ike decides to retreat, but the dragon goes after him this time, but Lee is defended by Fu, who then injects an auction into his own neck, changing the color of his hair and eyes and releasing a large amount of power. He then tells Ike to do what he needs to do if he doesn't regain consciousness. Transformed with the dragon arm released, the guy starts to remember the princess telling him to study the practical uses of teleportation circles. This knowledge should be used when the princess is about to strike, and she explains that she's sharing this with him because it's her way of showing that she has no intention of letting him go. In the present, Fu lands a hit on Ulto Zora and then lands several other blows frantically, but is hit on the side afterward. However, the Thaumaturge doesn't seem phased. He bites the enemy with the mouth of his arm and activates magic absorption while using this power to keep pushing the superior dragon. They hit a building and destroy part of the construction while Ike just watches from afar. From the confrontation, the guy ends up seeing the top part of Fu's body flying away, so Ike decides to run after him. The problem is, the guy is falling into the abyss. In another part of the battlefield, Shin regains consciousness, realizing he's lost an arm and a leg. He gets angry because he's supposed to be the most talented person in the brigade. That's what everyone says, so if he's weak, it means everyone in the Silver Brigade is just a bunch of weaklings too. He says this with tears in his eyes, and as he grabs his sword and activates his power again, the short guy says he doesn't need a future anymore. He's covered in blue aura, and soon stands up with a more determined look. In the sky, you can still see the lights of Ragna facing Kamui. Shin then says that even if it's just for this moment, he's going to reach great heights because it's time to fly. Ike rushes to help Fu, grabbing him by the arm just before the wizard falls into the abyss, using his sword to prevent their descent. However, as the guy struggles to hold on, the dragon appears dishonestly to attack them. Luckily, Hisela starts firing at Ulto Zora to distract him. She also uses that stunning shout, but doesn't have much effect, and Zora himself counterattacks with a similar shout, sending the girl flying. Then the creature goes after her with its mouth open, but before she dies, Shin appears using immense power to land a blow on the dragon's face. Afterward, the blue energy emanating from his arms and leg disappears as the guy was already at his limit, and thus the short guy plummets, while Zora begins to bleed a purple fluid. Without giving him time to recover, the other soldiers also attack from a distance. At this moment, Ike has already emerged from the abyss with Fu and is trying to help the guy recover, but the Thaumaturge doesn't think it's worth the soldier's concern despite the right decision to prevent him from falling. What he intends is to use all the magic he absorbed to finish off Ulto Zora. Chris was listening to this conversation and offers to help preventing the dragon from getting away until the attack is ready, which according to Fu, will take 20 seconds. In the name of Garm and Shin, Chris, even with only one arm, 
is determined as Everin goes after the superior dragon, while we are taken to a flashback. We see Chris as a child and his mother saying that the blood of a great man runs in his veins, so the boy needs to be educated perfectly to be ready for the day the palace summons him. The woman worked as a maid in the palace and became the king's mistress when Chris was born. Maybe all of this was just the delusion of a crazy woman, but she believed it, and the boy was raised to believe it too. As a result, the boy grew up under the pressure of being a perfect child, with his mother imposing rules and criticizing any flaws. This lasts until her death, when on her deathbed, she tells her son to continue on this path to maintain her pride, still confusing all of this with love and hope. But after losing his mother, Chris becomes a mercenary, he would do anything for the right price. But no matter how he lived his life, the blonde never felt free. Until one day, Princess Starlia saves him from a mature dragon, and praises him for enduring the fight well. Apparently, it was in this battle that he lost his arm. The guy is amazed by the princess's image. After introducing himself as Christopher Algren, he tells her he is a mercenary and ends up being recruited by the princess, feeling freedom in his heart for the first time. In the present, Chris is using so much power that he turns red because this is the most important fight of his life. He and the dragon exchange blows fiercely at high speed, while the effects of extreme effort begin to affect the man's body. The impact of their attacks causes a shockwave so powerful that it generates insanely strong air displacements, destroying several buildings around. Even poor Ike has to run to avoid being hit along with few. Despite being determined, the blonde knows he's not special because everyone in the brigade has their own stories with a princess, and that's what makes them all strong. Meanwhile, Ike and Fu are already on top of a closer building watching Ulto Zora being knocked down for a moment. Fu takes the opportunity to tell his story, saying that he made certain substances and distributed them throughout the country until the princess caught him and made him work for her. He tells this because it might be the last chance to share the story. Ike also takes the opportunity and says he was sent to the brigade because he failed to capture those behind the substances. Despite everything, they consider that it was lucky. Ike helps Fu raise his arm, already shining with magic, and aim at Ulto Zora. At this moment, several purple spheres appear around the superior dragon, while Chris holds the axe stuck in one of its limbs. The blonde thinks about how they formed a beautiful team, then several spikes emerge from the spheres, piercing the dragon all over. After that, Ulto Zora wakes up in his humanoid form, seeing his giant dragon form right in front of him. He first thinks it's a monster, but soon recognizes that it's himself, or rather, a part of himself that was torn off. Suddenly, some flames appear over the purple blood and spread until they reach what's left of the humanoid part. With Ike approaching, Ulta Zora praises the good work the humans did, saying that this is his honest opinion, and that he would like to reward these enemies with something beyond just their lives. Without saying a word, Ike prepares his sword. Ulta Zora thinks this is a terrible end, but despite everything, he has no regrets, especially about meeting Princess Lakusha. At this moment, Ike finishes off the superior driving with a mercy blow. With tears on his face, he remembers the comrades he lost. Then he goes to what's left of Fu's body to close his eyes, and Nazarena also approaches to give the bad news about Princess Starlia. Anyway, Ike knows there is still work to be done, so he stands up. In the meantime, Crimson is having some difficulty dealing with Ultimatia. The Dragon Woman is launching several attacks in a frenzied sequence. Not all of them seem to be hitting the target, but some hit the Redhead's energy shield, who is already fed up with this dispute. Crimson knows that Ultimatia is the weakest of the monarchs, but she has an immense reserve of magic and can overcome most of the superior dragons simply by randomly firing attacks. Seeing that he can't get close, the former monarch decides to make a psychic attack. Magically, he eliminates all the noise and amplifies his own voice to start talking to his opponent. Crimson then calls Ultimatia dreadful because of her appearance and negatively compares her to Karula, stating that only the monarch had to go so far as to become a monster to be special. The redhead even refers to her as product number 19,835 and questions what appearance her god has as he doesn't have a true form. In fact, he assumes any appearance that the person seeing him would find most difficult to ignore. Following this, Crimson questions if Ultimatia's god told her to ravage the country just because a cake shop went bankrupt, like a child throwing a tantrum. The mage clings to this last phrase, emphasizing that the god Ultimatia sees is a little girl with a face identical to hers, which is also the same as all the sisters who were lost because of her. This rents a space in Ultimatia's mind, causing her to recall the reason she came here, initially because she wanted to be kind and didn't want to choose which humans to save, but the person she most wanted to save was herself. Let's then move to another flashback, this time from the Sun Era, in a place called Abyss of Hell. Amidst the war, a Solarian frontline base is shown. At the location, several injured soldiers are being healed by various Karulas, this occurs one year and two months after Ultimatia's birth. 
She uses magic to activate the healing properties of the man's bandages, but it wouldn't be enough. So the girl uses time control magic to accelerate the healing speed. Unfortunately, it is at this moment that the main Karula calls five other Karulas by number, including 19,835, who would become Ultimatia. They are summoned to the special care unit. Inside, in a separate room, Karula asks for help to heal an important man who has actually already lost his life, but Karula managed to freeze the body in time five minutes after death, so it can still be reverted back to life. 19,835 warns that the man she was healing is about to die, but Karumala says that this subject was of the fourth class. While the man they are going to heal now is of the second class, so he is more important because of his support for the military campaign. After assisting Karula, 19,835 goes to the man she was healing before, but it's too late, and she laments. She finds the man's photo frame and realizes he had a family, meaning there are people who will mourn his loss. At this moment, the main Karula arrives to thank her, noticing that 19,835 is new, so she explains that when they felt they needed more Karulas in that place, her maturation was accelerated. With this, the leader tells her not to worry, that she will soon get used to the routine after all, they are the same person. Suddenly, the newcomer notices that the leader's face is aging. This is happening because she pushed the limit in this last operation. With this, her life comes to an end, but before that, she mentally warns all the others and chooses the next one to be responsible for the place. Seeing the leader pass away, the newcomer becomes emotional, and the older one comments that she is different. After that, the young woman walks through the insulation reflecting on the fact that this place is the front line between humans and dragons, which makes life very insignificant. At that moment, the man who was healed appears and thanks her for being saved, grateful for being able to obliterate even more dragons. Even knowing that the Karula who healed him is dead, she disguises her sadness and replies that those who work hard for the Lord's cause always have a place in God's heart, and she feels good to be able to help in this process. In the present, Chimera and the Mecha continue to face the giant Borgias. Suddenly, the barrier around the area is deactivated. Then the armor transforms into a giant weapon and fires at the dragon. As the main head starts to burn, the smaller ones try to retaliate, but Chimera takes advantage of finally having enough shade and creates darkness serpents to fight the physical serpents. Suddenly, Nebulum contacts the Elder mentally, stating that he has discovered that spatial magic allows a person to approach God under certain conditions, but he thinks the previous winged monarch wanted to become God. He also thinks that he himself could achieve that, but it's already too late, so he leaves the rest to Borgias and apologizes for not living up to his expectations. The Elder denies this statement because the young man has surpassed expectations many times and has a promising future, where he will become the heart of the lineage. Finally, the young man tells Borgias to take his place and protect Ultimatia. Borgias then protests loudly, while in the physical world, the giant is finally brought down. For a brief moment, it seems like Crimson's team has won, but suddenly it turns to night again because the barrier has risen once more. Borgias then reemerges in a new form, apparently even more formidable. With a simple dark attack, he destroys both opponents at once. Then he forms a portal and crosses to the place where Silm is chewing on Nebulum. The dragon releases a burst of energy so powerful that it tears a rift in the ground and leaves nothing in its wake except Nebulum's bones. After that, the superior dragon approaches what remains of the old companion and disciple. Remembering some of Ultimatia's words when she introduced herself as one of the greatest leaders of the Solarian Church, Karula, the Saint of Time. The Elder comments that there is nothing more important than protecting the progenitor. As flowers grow among the bones, more words from Karula are heard about her being one of the most valuable humans. Despite the importance of protecting the monarch, at least for now, Borges only wishes to mourn the loss of his companion. The final words of Kalura's presentation would be a question of who will mourn her death when she is gone. Then the Elder uses a power to open a dimensional rift, and when Crimson is almost finishing Ultimatia, the rift appears in this space, interrupting the battle's conclusion. Hey folks, we're kicking off the new anime season, and if you enjoyed this anime and want to see more of it, go ahead and hit that like button down below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We need your support to reach our goal of 70,000 subscribers. Every subscription counts and helps us grow our community. Catch you next time.